<laughs> and we're live. Welcome back to another Corona Geek here where we talk all about mobile app development using Corona SDK. I'm your host, Charles McKeever, and today it's me and Ed. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm laughing. I was thinking, well, that's going to be a short intro today. <laughs> We have a large panelist. No, wait. We have just one panelist here today. That's He's right. not large. The panel's not large. <laughs> well, you know, things happen. Everybody, this is an open panel where anyone can show up at any time. You're invited every week to be here and uh, participate. So anyone can show up at any time. And everyone cannot show up at any time as well. So <laughs> as they've demonstrated. As, de as demonstrated here. Congratulations, so, team. Yeah, yeah, yay, team. Uh, no, it's all good. So, uh, so thanks for being, for being here, Ed, and uh, thanks for you for watching out there in the comfort of your home, hopefully. Um, if you didn't get a chance to catch last week's show, you certainly should because uh, Ed was on again, and uh, as he always is, and he talked about composer library and what it meant for scene management. So just to give you a highlight, highlight of some of the nuggets that came out of that conversation there was uh, there was a framework for scenes for uh, to, to kind of set up how uh, a normal app would be set up there was uh, a, cons a conversation about scene speed and how to optimize that uh, we talked about uh, declaring variables and functions and how to kind of localize things to make things faster and then there was a, a conversation about scene sequences and how uh, the different um, the different events happen within within a scene. So that was a long conversation. It was about an hour and a half long, and you can find that at youtube.com slash coronageek, along with all the other videos that we put out every week. Um, and I am also in the process of chopping that video up into snack size um, bits that you can consume whenever you want to. So all those things that I just mentioned will be videos on the channel probably within the next day or so. Um, I would have had it today, but for some reason, you know, the the gremlins were against me. So uh, I will get that out to you next uh, next couple of days, and along with probably some snippets from today's show as well. Uh, speaking of today's show, we are going to talk about Composer Library again, and this time we're going to hit touch on memory usage, uh, persistent data between scenes, uh, custom transitions, and if we have time, uh, we'll we'll move into talk, a discussion about uh, trans the transition library and how um, the workhorse of Corona SDK can be used to create motion in your in your applications. So I'm not sure if we'll have time for that. I don't know. You tell me yet. I I don't know. I, yeah. I'm not. I'm not too concerned about uh, you know muscling through to to get everything in on one show. If we need to split it up into several separate segments, we can do that as well. My, yeah, my plan is actually. Uh, Probably just to try to finish our cover, uh, finish covering the composer stuff today, and get a fresh start on the next hangout, or um, and talk about transition. Just that's a nice split for people, I think. Okay. So, I mean, I know you can cut up the shows, anyways, but yeah, it's yeah. Okay. Well, I the the main point there just being, uh, you know, if it takes us a couple shows, three shows, four shows, whatever to cover a topic, that's cool. Uh, I know we live in a 140 character world, but sometimes you know you got to go deep. To get the to get the fish. I don't live in that world. You don't live in that As world. I'm about to demonstrate. I'm going to go way beyond 140 characters. <laughs> well, for those of you who are new to the show and have never uh, watched us before, you can find Ed at RoamingGamer.com, where he publishes all sorts of uh, helpful resources on Corona. He's got templates over there for games. He's got tutorials. Uh, he hangs out in the forums a lot and answers questions. And he also has an SSK, which is a uh, think of it as a uh, a library to shortcut the creation of common tasks within your app. So if you have a game that you want to create buttons for or or things like that, he's got he got you covered over there with uh, Corona SSK. Yeah, I've been so, thinking about renaming it the Library for Lazy People. No, oh, <laughs> you, you probably get a lot of signups. <laughs> I probably you'd probably get really popular that way. Probably, yeah. I know people are re they're listening to this reading here. Look, I'm in the wrong I'm in the wrong medium here. <laughs> reading here. people are listening right now saying, "Yeah, that's not funny. You just called me lazy." Just, no, I take it hey, back. I, I'm sorry. Let's just let's just own it. Let's just own it. I don't. You know what? Even I, as a I, I meant for me, the lazy person over here. Even even as a, a developer, I like tools that speed up my development time. I don't. You know, I got I got stuff to do. 
So yeah, honestly, I'm I am a lazy developer. I don't like to do complicated tasks over and over. If I can find a way to shorten that up, I'm willing to take a performance hit, even if I don't have to write the code all the time. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So you get, just get it out the door. Right. Uh, speaking, of, speaking of things that get, help get that stuff out the door, uh, we mentioned this a number of times on the show, and uh, Jason Schroeder over at jasonschroeder.com has put out a module for progress ring. So if you want to have a little progress ring that shows uh, activity in your app, you can go over to his website. We'll put a link in the show notes, of course, but you can find a library or there a, mo a module, rather, that allows you to add a progress ring to your app in one line of code. Now, yeah, I'm I mentioned I, I, and I've mentioned it a number of times on the show, and everybody's probably like, yeah, 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 you know, regulars are like, shut up, we know, we know about it already. But it's really well done. If you haven't been over there, go check it out. Uh, he's got, it's, it's completely documented. He's got a, uh, not only the, the module itself, but a sample project that goes along with it that shows how it works. Uh, just as you normally do, Ed, he's created a little sampler that shows um, all the different variations of things that you can adjust sliders and, and uh, kind of get an idea of, how the thing will react before you ever even use the code. Yeah. So I, I keep mentioning it because it's definitely worth taking a look. And um, you know, every time that I mention it, Jason, Jason says, "Hey, thanks for the mention on the show." So we're gonna try to get him on at some point and have him step us through the module and show us kind of you know what he was thinking and how he accomplished some of these things and maybe you know what his plans are for in the future. So I wanted to point out. Um, I'm glad you brought it up again because he actually not only has he done a good job on it, but he went back and said, "Hey, there, there's a small problem with this that people have encountered," and he fixed it. So um, he did something really clever in this, in which he generates dynamically a mask, a masking image to create the round. Because what you need is a image to mask the circle to cut off the edges, so it's visually pleasing, and. Uh, the problem that people who wanted to do this before faced was is some people wanted a, a ring that was like 100 pixels wide, other people wanted 80 pixels wide, or you know the, the radius to be, say, 40 pixels or 50 pixels. So they thought, well, I need a new mask for everyone. And I think he said, no, 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 you don't need that. What you need is some way to create that mask on the fly. And so people should check out his... Uh, the demo there and look really closely at the code and see what he did because that was it was really bright and it doesn't have to be he did a circular mask but the same technique could be used for any shape mask that you need in your game so people who are out there they're like I really want to do this game or I want a mask with a irregular shape but I don't want to have to create every single mask by hand before the game ever I want it to be dynamic you can use his technique to do this it's uh, it's pretty brilliant Awesome. Well, I didn't see. I didn't even know. He's got like that. bonus content in there. I forgot that. I wanted to say there's bonus content. It's like he doesn't even mention it. But you run his demo, and you there's a button at the bottom where you can change the color of the wheel, and you click it, and up pops this beautiful, beautifully implemented color picker. So I don't know if you remember seeing that, but I thought, wow, this is like a twofer. I didn't. Well, I just I just didn't even think about it at the time. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, so it's another one of those things that people are always asking for. And I thought, wow, it's like he should have given himself two pets on the back of this one. <laughs> he split it into maybe maybe he will after the, watching the show. He'll be like, hey, I'll split that out into a whole separate library and get a get another round of kudos. I have I've already stolen it and put put part of it. Uh, I've abstracted it into uh, SSK too. Don't worry, I've given credit where credit is due and linked back. But I did in fact take some of what he did there and uh, reuse it. You know, you bring up a, you brought up an interesting point. I don't know if you meant to or not, but I was uh, this weekend. I was looking through some repos on GitHub and uh, looking for a, uh, an answer to some questions that I had for something completely diff different, unrelated to Corona. And uh, I came up with two competing solutions to the problem. And it really came down to one, um, you know, how how did they solve the problem? Uh, how elegant eloquently did they solve the problem, uh, which would mean how easy or hard it would be for me to understand it and implement it. And then two was, when was the last time that their solution was updated? Uh, because if they, you know, one, uh, to give you an example, one of them was updated uh, two years ago, and one of them was updated like 19 days ago. And, and I was like, well, okay, I'll probably go with the one that was 19 days ago. 
uh, just because I know that the, the developer is actively working on it. So, uh, you know, that, I think that's important that, 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 the, that the project be maintained. It's hard, though. You know, if people yeah. are like me, they've got code all over the web, right. it seems like, and you're, I'm lazy and disorganized, so... <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Even a, even just a uh, README update that says, you know, uh, there's been no need to update this project. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like that. Right, that, right. Some, it's, something, it's some works. Activity. Even uh, even a uh, I know sometimes people will, will report issues and and then the developers will respond to that in a sort of a sidebar comment sort of thing. And even those, if I can find even that where you know there's been some sort of activity on the project, I, I at least feel like it's being maintained. Uh, yeah. And, but you know there are times. Just to be fair, there are times when the code works, so there's no right. reason to to go out there and sort of ping it. You know, plus one, it just it's just it just works. So just use it. But uh, but anyway, yeah. So Jason's out there, you know, actively monitoring and keeping it fresh. So it's cool. Yeah. Well, also people have uh, he uh, he lets people post right to his forum. His uh, not his forum, but his uh, his blog post on his website. So and then he responds there, or just makes a fix based on what people have found, which is what he did. I'm pretty sure on this last update. Sweet. Okay. Well, a few other housekeeping items here before we we get into today's topic. Uh, if you haven't already, you need to go over to the forums and leave us a topic suggestion for future hangouts. We've we've already got a number of good suggestions, but we need your thoughts on this because uh, we want to talk about the things that you want to talk about. So just to kind of give you an idea, we've, we've had some throw-ins already about uh, using advanced animations like like with uh, Corona Plus Spine. Uh, so you can have you know something involving bones. We've, uh, somebody has, has, StarCrunch has uh, recommended Lua 5.3 as a topic of conversation, localization, game design, uh, custom widgets, saving file formats, uh, tools and editors, social media plugins. Lava Level wants to know more about you know that conversation, and then app privacy. Uh, I know Chunky Apps uh, was in there having a conversation and with Lava Level about you know can you protect your apps from being uh, pirated through in-app purchase or just you know straight out purchase. So that was a conversation that was it's interesting. If you're you're curious about what's what they're saying over there, go check it out. Uh, and while you're there, leave a topic suggestion. We, we need to know what it is that's important to you. Hey, we're going to post a link to that particular thread in the um, show yeah. notes, right? Yeah, we'll put a link in the show notes. It's kind of a gnarly one. I don't want to read yeah. it out. So, I'm, but, I'd uh, be glad to see people. I mean, there's a lot in there already for us to I go through occasionally. And, but it's, I mean, I'm very much looking forward to more more questions because I love that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, and... and uh, just on last week's show, you know, one of the topics that we're going to talk about today is you know, persisting data between scenes. That was a comment um, that was left on last week's show. So we're we're trying to make sure that we're following up and talking about the things that are important to the community. So uh, so don't think that just because there are topics already there that you know that there's too much or yours won't be heard or or whatever. You know, we need we need your suggestions. So go do it. Uh, if you if you haven't been to the blog lately, go check it out. There are a number of tutorials over there that are very interesting. Uh, Greg Pugh, who's been on the show a number of times, he's published a tutorial on creating Android apps for uh, Android TV, creating apps for Android TV, which we said here recently that uh, Sony was demoing, demoing their television at CES, uh, and they were all running Android TV. So it's it's coming. You know, there, it's, it's going to be more mainstream, and uh, there's a good tutorial over there that can get you started. Yeah, I think it's the year to s definitely consider publishing to uh, set-top boxes if you can easily do so. Yeah, exactly. At least pretty straightforward nowadays. At least get familiar with with the conversation, so that yeah. you know uh, it, it's going to become more and more mainstream. I know that as part of my goal for 26 games this year, if a game fits controller play, I will definitely be targeting those platforms as a secondary after I get out to uh, iTunes. Yeah, I can't wait to see, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't have, you know, like everybody else, I don't have any insight as to what's going on with Apple TV, but I can imagine that eventually, um, you know, they will 
beef up that platform and allow developers to develop apps for it, mm -hmm. and then and then you know and then the game is on, right? It'll be a head-to-head -head battle between yeah. the platforms. I think that will. I think that'll turn up the heat. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, Amazon's already you know trying to. Yeah, they're leading that for sure. Take things up a notch. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, and then if you want to check out, there's a, a tutorial on calculating distance between map points uh, out there. So if you want to do something like that, know how what's the difference between uh, the, the distance between A and B, uh, even with taking into account the curvature of the Earth, you know that kind of thing. If you work with maps, uh, there's a good tutorial out, out there. And then also there's a tutorial on uh, working with Swift and Corona cards. So if you are in that camp, interested in uh, merging, you know, native code together with um, Corona code, then that's a great way to to get your feet wet. And there's also coming up, I think tomorrow is going to be a, a tutorial, Tuesday tutorial on uh, converting a project to Corona cards. And uh, and there's a good video that goes along with that as well. So you should check that out tomorrow. And then last but not least, uh, or la clo close to last, ne next to last, is uh, Corona is hiring. They're looking for core engineers. So if you are an engineer or you know somebody who is an engineer, then find the link in the show notes and send them th that uh, link and go and apply because uh, we're looking for smart individuals. And I know there's a bunch of them out in the community, so uh, why not apply? And then also for this month, for January, we're playing Chip Chain. So if you go to chip-chain.com and you can download uh, for iOS or Android, you can download Chip Chain. And what you're going to want to do for a chance to win a $50 gift card is you are going to want to play the two-minute challenge and then rack up as many points as you can, take a screenshot of your final score, and then share that on Facebook. So facebook.com slash coronageek. Share it on the Corona Geek Facebook wall. And then on February 2nd, which I think is right around the corner, is that next week? Maybe not. Um, we're going to announce the winner of, um, now, now I'm curious, it is a, w a week from now, two weeks from now. Well, if you don't count this week, whatever. It's coming up. Uh, we're going to announce the winner, and uh, that, that person is going to get a $50 gift card. So go, go play. Go play and win. All right, I think that's it. Um, let's talk about Composer Library. Uh, I'm interested in this whole idea of the memory usage between scenes and then also persisting data between scenes because I know that's a, a pretty common thing that people want to do. At least it's something that I know I wanted, wanted to do f first rattle out of the box. You're, you're muted. You're still muted. Sorry, yeah, I just made a mistake. Yeah, this stuff never failed. <laughs> Sorry, folks, people listening, just gonna have to bear with me for one second. I, are you are you coding on the fly again? I am coding on the fly because I messed up the example that starts the ball rolling here. Well, that's all right. Well, I'll, here, I'll, while you're doing that, I'll talk. Um, last okay. week, uh, Ed demoed a sampler for transitions and provided all the code. So if you haven't had a chance, go check out last week's show notes. There's a link to the code uh, repo where you can download everything for the sampler and look at the source code and all that kind of stuff. Also, we provided a scene, fra uh, scene framework, which has things like a splash screen, uh, an option screen, uh, you know, a play screen, that kind of thing in it. And those things are all wired together. So it's a good example of how to uh, get everything structured and working together um, if you're going to start with an app. Uh, I know that in the documentation it talks about getting the Composer library template. So basically you take the code, copy it out of the uh, documentation and, and pop it into a Lua file and that sort of start, is your starter boilerplate file for a, a Lua scene or a Composer scene. Uh, but what this scene framework does that Ed provided is that it's already everything's already kind of pre-wired together and it shows examples of everything. So go check out the show notes and go download the code for that. Everything is, is linked to a repo that you can, like I said, pull it and use it as a template. And, uh, and one of the other good tips that Ed gave out last week, and I thought this was good, was that on the, the sampler, the transition sampler, it's a great way for you to be able to see what the different uh, composer transitions do from scene to scene 
uh, and play around with the different settings, but it's also a good sampler to give to clients and, and uh, or other people that you're working with and say, here are options that we can draw from and see which one that you like and then tell me which one those are and then we can go from there because sometimes it's, it's really hard for people to visualize these things just from reading the documentation or, or having it explained to them verbally but once they can see it and mess with it uh, then it's you know it's a lot easier to, gro to grok so uh, go check that out it's in the show notes from last week okay I'm ready now I've okay. undone my mistake okay good I was running out of words yeah, no, perfect <laughs> <laughs> so to segue from where you uh, left off there, so um, this week we were continuing our discussion of Composer, and I have added two new examples to the Composer download that you'll find out on the GitHub link, which you'll find at the with the show notes here. Uh, six and seven are the new folders, and in six is a long, relatively long, somewhat complex, and so we'll take our time going through it, examination of uh, memory usage in Corona as it relates generally to Composer. Now some of the things we'll talk about today are not specific to Composer, but uh, I try to discuss them in the light of Composer. And then um, I'll finish off with a discussion of another thing which I find really exciting about the Composer library which is the ability to create your own custom scene transitions. So uh, if you remember from last week, um, I demoed the transitions uh, project where you got to see all the different transitions. I'll just show it here on the screen real quick. It's easier to talk to it. So uh, this is what you were talking about giving to clients to uh, take a look at. So we could do a crossfade, uh, let's say do a zoom out in fade rotate to go to the scene. So these this list here is basically what comes stock with Corona, at least at the time that I wrote this example. But if you don't find a transition you like, you can make your own. You can make your own custom transition. All you have to do is sort of understand how to examine the existing ones to pull apart the pieces and build up your own, um, how to describe it, I'll describe it when I show it to you. How's that sound? <laughs> so the point is, is that uh, the last thing I'll talk about today is how to add to this list of existing transitions to get just what you want, or you can copy an existing transition and modify it slightly, which is what I generally do uh, on client projects where the client says, I really like that transition, but it, it this one thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll, just, I'll change the sequence or the order, or I'll make the new scene come in on top instead of below or something like that. So let's go back to our memory discussion. All right, so on the left side of the screen here, you should be able to see some code. And what I'm looking at is main.lua in the, and I always do this slow down thing when I'm talking and I, I'm trying to be a little more clear, <laughs> in 6-memory. Uh, so that's the folder that we're looking at now. And within here, you're going to find a, a standard project, at least the way I set up my projects. And under the IFC folder are 10 different scenes, which we will explore different memory phenomenon and topics that people have requested for the show. But to set the, um, to set the mood, in a, in a sense, before we even look at scenes, what I wanted to do was demonstrate the basic principle of what we're measuring here is there's two kinds of memory usage that we're if we forget about actually there's three kinds you could think also there is the uh, video memory which we are not talking about today I'm talking about main memory usage which is uh, memory usage that stores game objects or Lua objects and um, as I was putting this demo together what I realized was something that I sort of knew and had forgotten it, which is that Corona doesn't manage memory in all cases exactly the same way as Lua does. And so I need to demonstrate the difference so that people don't get confused when they see some behavior and they're like, oh man, I got a leak. No, you don't have a leak. What you're seeing is what Corona is doing versus traditional Lua mem memory management. So, um, set the tone. There is a... Uh, 
a file in the root directory called memsync, just for lack of a better name. And what this thing does, in a nutshell, is depending on the test type that I'm running, which is either uh, Lua objects, and I'll show you where to set this, or display objects, it will run a test that basically creates a bunch of display objects, or it creates a bunch of tables with subtables containing a big, long string, a lorem ipsum string, just to give it something to fill memory up with. It's just a, it could be anything, but uh, this was a quick way to create big table objects to demonstrate um, creating, filling up memory, and then releasing it. So uh, what you'll see when you run, let's do the Lua objects first. On line 124 or 125 of the main.lua file, you're going to see a global test type. And um, when you get the code, it should look just like this. It'll be set to display objects, and the Lua objects line will be commented out, and do memsync will be executed. As I go through and run this demo, I will start to use the code below, and I will comment out this, and I may choose to do Lua objects. So as far as the globals go, if you want to do Lua objects, all you got to do is comment out line 125. Basically what that's going to do is set the variable twice. The first time it'll be display objects. The second time it'll set it to Lua objects, and from then on, as it executes down through the code here, Lua objects will be the value in there. and if I save this and rerun this sample, you'll see that uh, with Lua objects, it doesn't use up a whole bunch of memory, so it's very small. In fact, I could probably make that a little bit bigger just by adding another zero here. I caution you, though, if you're editing this, don't leave, don't leave it at a million when you do the display objects, because otherwise you're going to probably run out of memory, especially if you're doing this on a device. For some reason, I've still got this messed up. Okay, this number should be increasing, so I've still made a mistake somewhere in here. And I'm not sure exactly what it is. All right, well, this is working in the primaries, so we'll just pretend that that didn't happen in the video here. Uh, and we'll put it on display object. So you're saying... In the, prim the primary purpose of this was I wanted to demonstrate that one, it produces something, so when I ran the display objects version, mm -hmm. you'll see that the memory usage went up to 14.4 megabytes. Wow. So let's do it again. Starts off at 0 0.27. Two seconds later, which is when this runs, it goes up to 14.1 megabytes. So if we look for do mem sync in main Lua, what I'm doing is a perform with delay, two second wait, and all it is is a function that requires the memsync file. And by requiring it, what it does is it just executes the contents. And the reason I did this example, besides to demonstrate the meter, is I wanted to show that if you require the same module over and over, it's going to execute it once and only once. So people who see this the first time, they're like, oh, well, 14.4, so that should be what, like, like 60 megs of use now, because you're doing it four times. No, it's still going to be 14.4. So we run it again. 14 point, I'm sorry, 14.1. So uh, the point of this is when you make a module, which is what this is, every external file that you load, whether or not it returns a value, is a module. It gets loaded into memory as soon as it is required. And so you've got to be extremely cautious because unless you know what you're doing and know how to unload modules, which there is a way, and I know people will ask, and I'll say, in this show, I do not have the code in place to show you how to unload modules from memory. Um, but uh, if you do not unload modules, and all of your modules create huge... Uh, like tables, or they use up a lot of memory. For example, one thing that some people might do is they have a module, and they may decide, hey, I need to get um, some textures ready for animations, so I'll make my sprite sheets. And they do the code right in the body here. They're just like, you know, this is the code for making the sprite sheet. Obviously, it's just me typing. As soon as that executes, that sprite sheet code will execute and load uh, it'll you start using up some of your texture memory. It'll start using up some of your main memory. 
and it will never go away. It will always be there unless you do something to unload it. So it's just a word of caution. Uh, be careful what you do in your modules. Don't go crazy and have every module create large objects because you're going to fill up your memory before you ever, ever start doing your coding. But at the same time, be aware that if you need to do some kind of caching or you need to do some prep work, once you've loaded a module, it's loaded. From then on, every time you require it, Lua just says, hey, did I load that already? Yes, I did. Boom. Uh, and this is according to the way Lua is set up in Corona. You could set it up to unload every time, but you don't want to do that. So as, Lua use, uh, as Corona uses Lua, modules are loaded once and retained in memory forever. I don't think they ever clear out automatically after that. All right, so let's get on to the interesting stuff. I'm going to leave this on um, display objects for now. Say, no, I take that back. I'm going to make it Lua objects. And let me just show you what I've done to the code here. So I've uncommented line 125. I commented out the do mem sync function that I was calling. And then I merely put two comment um, markers here, right there, on line 129 to open up this code to make it execute. So what I've done here based on 129, it said uh, undo or ignore this multi-line comment. You, you commented the comments. Yeah, I could, I could have done this. But why do two steps when you can do right. this one? Okay. All right. So when we run this now, what you're going to see, uh, and uh, I suggest that people run this as a borderless device using the iPhone at 2x settings, which is 640 by 960, because that is how I have set up the screen size in the, um, the demo. Now, it should run fine in every other resolution. But if you want it to look exactly the way it looks in the video here, run it at 640 by 960. And I prefer to run borderless, but you know it's up to you. It depends on how big your monitor is. For me, that fits perfectly on the screen. All right, so what you're going to see here is um, a column of buttons on the right, which if we were to press any of these, would load up that scene. A column of white dots on the left with text next to them. Now, the white dots. When they're white, that means the scene has never been loaded. Mm. If it is green, that means that scene has been loaded into memory. It's been created, that is. And if it's red, that means the scene was destroyed. And I do this because I want to demonstrate the differences between before, after creation, and after destruction, and then maybe after we go back and create it again. Uh, then the numbers here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, correspond to the buttons. So this scene button here will open up this scene or create it. The parentheses here tell you what the sort of like the short name for this demo is. So for example, scene 1 is an empty scene. It's a starting place to sort of like set the tone, how much memory is used by a, a blank scene that does nothing using my template, my uh, the provided uh, template that I gave you. Uh, and then the little comment here at the end will change. Um, for example, if I click on scene one here, it says it turns this dot green, the empty scene, and it says it was created in one millisecond. So that's usually going to be one or zero on the simulator because it, there was no work. So it just basically, how as, as quickly as possible, it loaded it into memory and displayed it. Uh, and for this, for this uh, project, I am not doing any um, special transition. So every transition is an instantaneous transition to the scene. So you, you'll see no fancy sliding or anything like that, because that would be distracting for the purposes of a memor uh, memory example. Uh, lastly, um, at the top here, just to keep everything clear, it's going to print out, uh, as soon as we run, uh, load the uh, example, it's going to print out the test type. So you can see that I've selected Lua objects over here. We're doing a Lua objects test type. And then uh, when you load a scene, it'll tell you what scene. It's just a little bit of extra here just to verify. It points uh, a message up in the upper right corner. And then 
some of these as we get further down will print little messages in the space I had left. You have to forgive me, I was sort of running out of space, but uh, they'll print out when we get into the shared data and the persistent data examples, they'll print out little messages so you can kind of see what's going on and I'll explain what the messages mean, what the code is doing, uh, because it's it's uh, at that point it's related to the topic, like sharing data between scenes, persisting data, etc. And I did not change these titles. This is incorrect. Oh, goodness gracious! Please tell me that I okay. I do. Um, I'm gonna have to change that on the fly or explain it as we go. That is unacceptable. All right. We'll beat, we'll beat you later. Because these 9 and 10 are actually, they are examples. And I've, I've messed up here. Okay. Wonderful. I thought I had that all done. All right. Good job, Ed. All right. So let's start off with the first topic, which is uh, unmanaged and managed local data. So um, let's load scene one. Creates in zero milliseconds, one millisecond. Super fast. Memory usage is 0 0.31 megabytes. Texture usage is 0 0.07. Um, we're going to focus pretty much on the orange number here. This this number may change a little bit as we do the examples, but it's not uh, it's not an interesting topic for today's discussion. So in scene two, which is the one that I'm about to load, what I've done is uh, this is again using the template that I provided last week, and it's got the uh, organization where I put all the um, locals and forward declarations and localizations and all that good stuff at the top. And what I've done on line 20 here is I've created a variable called big table, but I don't put anything in it yet. When this scene is created, what I'm going to do, if we skip this first part which prints out the little pink scene message, line 58, I'm going to create a blank table, and then depending on the test type, I'm either going to fill that table with a bunch of subtables containing text for Lua objects, or I'm going to create, uh, what is it, 100,000 random squares with random colors of random sizes arranged randomly in a column approximately over here. And I'm going to put them all in the table. Now this is the unmanaged example. And so uh, this is sort of like covering what we talked about last week where I showed the good example and the bad example. I'm just going to point it out here. And uh, let me get the code lined up. So you can see the two. So scene two and scene three are exactly the same, except scene three corrects the problem. So again, this is one of those cases where people have messed up the management. And it's and, and just and just for those who, who don't know what we're talking about, last week you mentioned that when you create yeah. your display objects, you need to put them in the scene group in order for a uh, composer to know about them and then manage them. That's right. Exactly. And uh, so let's go, actually, I, I've done this in reverse. Let's do display objects, because this is where the big reveal comes from. So we're doing display objects. We're doing scene two. This is the bit of code that creates the scene objects. And as you can see here, at no point do I insert these temporary, so I, I get a uh, handle to the rectangle. At no point do I insert the rectangle um, handle into the scene group, which is provided to me by the by composer. Now, if we look at scene three, I do, in fact, do it. This is where I do it correctly. I create it. I set some variables. I store it in my table so I can track it in my game later on and find it and do something with it. But I also insert it into the scene group. In other words, I tell Composer, please manage this. When it's time to destroy it, you're in charge. You destroy it. I'm not going to be in charge of this. So the big reveal is is that if I run this example, click scene 1, 0 0.31 megabytes, go to scene 2, takes a moment, 16.14 megabytes. Now I'm going to click scene 1, and what it's going to do, let me just verify that I've got this set up right. Yes. So in, in main Lua, on line 33, I've told it recycle on scene change, which means every time I change the scenes, it's going to destroy the scene that I'm in as I leave. So yep. I'm currently in scene two. I'm going to click on scene one. And it's going to destroy the scene after it creates scene one. So let's do it. Now, if everything were correctly done, 
what we'd expect to see is this to go back down, the number, but we're not going to see that. So it says, hey, I destroyed scene two, but the memory usage didn't go down a whole lot. Something is wrong. So the problem is, is that I, as I said in this example here, I did not insert the objects into the scene group. They're not being managed. So this is the unmanaged example. But in the managed case, let me reload it. Let's go to scene one, 0 0.31, scene three, 16.14. Now when I go back to scene one, most people, this is where people get confused. They're going to expect this to go back down to 0 0.31 or whatever we started at. It's not. It's going to go down significantly, but it's not where we started. So and, why, and why is that? I'm going to explain that. Let's okay. leave that as a hanging okay. question, okay? okay. So, okay. But, but, the, but here's a point that I, I want, to, want to highlight at the moment is that... Um, Last week you showed an example where when you went from scene one to scene two and then back to scene one, you had green dots and red dots on the screen. And when uh, and when the objects were given to composer to the scene group, those objects, those those green dots, um, those red dots and green dots, they they went away and they came back and they went away and they came back. I mean, they were two separate scenes. But when when the, the scene or when the objects were not given to the group or were not inserted into the group and you went back and forth between scenes, then you had green dots and red dots on the screen at the same time. And so that showed us visually that things weren't being managed and we were getting some odd results. And so the follow-up to that, I think, is that what we're seeing here is that not only are you getting odd results and seeing things on the screen, but you're also impacted in behind the scenes because your memory is not being managed. Exactly. And you can see that exact thing here where I went to scene one, go to scene one, go to scene two, it draws all the rectangles, go back to scene one, because I'm not managing them. These do not get removed. This is our problem right here. These didn't get destroyed. But it's scene three, I'll just go right there, pause them, go to scene one, boom, they're gone. They got destroyed. But this is where people get really confused. They're like, okay, wait, wait, wait. Started with scene one, 0 0.31 megabytes. Shouldn't it go back to 0 0.31? Oh man, Ed, you've got a leak in your code. I'm going to tell you 99% definitively because, and I'm saying 99% because I don't have the ability to look at the source code that Corona has used to do this, but I I've done this uh, enough that I'm pretty sure I can guess what they're doing in the background. What I believe the Corona staff has done is something uh, very smart, which is scene three is creating 100,000 objects, which, you know, if you're doing this on your device to test this, this may take a while, but if you're doing it on your PC like I am, it's pretty quick. But there's a hidden cost to this, which is... Um, when you set up data structures in memory to track these things, there's the Lua side storage, and then there's some stuff that they have to do over in the Corona side, sort of hidden from you, which manages all the display objectness of these things. And my guess here is, is they said, you know, it's costly for us to create this, these tracking mechanisms over here. So if we're creating them and destroying them constantly, we're going to have two problems. One, we're going to pay the cost every time to create it afresh. Two, because of the way memory lines up, we may start to get segmentation where um, it's kind of hard to explain, but if you imagine like a ruler where you've got one inch segments along your ruler and you create one inch objects, well every time you do that you can put one at you know inch one, another one at inch two, another one at inch three, and then if you delete one, and then you create another one, you can just put it right at the end. So let's say you fill your ruler up, you've got 12 inches. You delete inch 12, you create another one inch object, boom, fits right in there. But what happens if one time you create a one and a half inch object, and let's say you've got 11 and a half inches of your ruler filled up, you delete that, you delete another object that's one inch, you try to create a one and a half inch. Now theoretically you've got enough memory left, but you've got no one inch, uh, one and a half inch slot left over. 
the point is, is once you create memory objects, they stay where they're at, and it doesn't get like scrunched up, and it does. You don't fill the gaps. The only way to fill a gap in memory is if you've got an object that is as large as the gap or smaller. So you're saying they may uh, segmentation. So you're saying they may they may possibly be um, allocating these uh, this this uh, reference table or whatever uh, ahead of time, and then being and then just leaving it. Just leaving it. I'm pretty yeah. sure that they have a table that is a non-Lua table. It's something else, like a JavaScript table or something. I don't know. I don't know what's going on here, but some kind of table where they said, you know what, we're just going to let this thing get bigger and bigger, and uh, we will not remove it because it's more efficient to retain it as one big block of memory well, that we can just reuse over and over. Well, there's two there's two concepts that come to mind. One is uh, if anybody's ever defragged their Windows machine, they know exactly what you're talking about as far as uh, you know f fragmented memory or whatever is concerned. Right, your hard drive. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and, and two. Um, you know, if you've ever set up a, a hard drive, you know, gone to the store and bought a hard drive that was, let's just say, you know, 500 gig, and you only want actually wind up getting to use 490 gig, right? Because there's, there are, um, I can't remember what they call them at the moment, but on a hard drive there are basically these tables, you know, the reference tables that they they leave space for. Um, so basically, the hard file drive allocation fi tables. file allocation tables, yeah, where it has a reference table, so it says it can it can. Um, you manage everything, you know, so it's sort of a, a, an administrative management cost, you know, of, of the hard drive, and they usually, rather than put extra space on the hard drive, they just take out some of the hard drive that's you know, allocated to um, to you as a user. So, uh, so yeah, I can I can imagine those, I can relate those concepts to those um, those things. So, but it's interesting though to see see the visual representation of this, regardless of what's actually happening on behind the scenes. Um, let me ask you. There's. All, all, I, I want to show you one little thing. I'm sorry. I'm dying to show you this too. So there's one thing that makes me suspect that this is true even more. Is that you pay very close attention. Okay. So I run scene one, then I run scene two. Takes 1082. One point. Uh, basically, just shy of a second, right? Okay. So 1082 milliseconds to build the scene. Now I'm going to go destroy it. And then I'm going to go back and make it again, and it's going to be shorter. Interesting. It takes okay. less time. And in fact, it always consistently takes less time than it did the first time. Maybe not, you know, exactly the same amount of time, but it's always going to be shorter, mm. which tells me that some of the work was done up front. Right. They cashed away something, they skipped a step, and... The step that I'm guessing they skipped is the creation of that special table for tracking whatever it is they're tracking, something. Because that's the only thing I can imagine that is taking up two megabytes of storage, is some big table for tracking 100,000 objects. Right. So, okay, yeah, that, that, makes, that makes total sense. Okay, so before we completely lose the, our train of thought here, now this is where people get really confused, and you know, the first time I saw it, I got confused too. Let's do Lua objects. Now, Lua objects, it's just tables. So everything is purely on the Lua side of the split. For people who are listening who are not familiar with the way Corona works, you can think of it as a dual memory domain. There is the, sort of like the, the Lua stuff, all managed by the embedded uh, Lua interpreter. And then there's going to be some stuff that is managed by Corona, sort of like done on their side of the fence. Lua doesn't own it. Luna doesn't. Uh, Lua doesn't know about it. It's all up to the Corona guys to deal with that stuff. So we got Lua memory. We got Corona memory. So when we're creating Lua objects, you go through and you do this example. You do scene one, 0 0.31. Let's do scene two. I create a bazillion objects. I create 100,000 tables where each table contains 100 entries and each entry cre uh, contains this huge lorem ipsum. So I just created 10 million strings of lorem ipsum and stored them in 100,000 tables. Okay, and, and this is the unmanaged example. And this is the unmanaged example. Okay, now, now unmanaged is sort of a misnomer here because you don't insert Lua tables 
into scene groups because they're not display objects. Corona does not manage tables. Corona manages display objects. That's it. So yes, display objects and tables are very similar, but they're not exactly the same. So the question that was asked last week was, hey, you know when I kill a scene, does Corona like clean that up for me? And the answer was yes and no. If it's Lua tables, as soon as I go back here, 29.78 started off at what, 0 0.31? You think I'd remember this number by now. Yes. It's unmanaged. I'm not doing anything special. I'm not setting the table to nil. I'm not doing anything special in here. I'm just merely destroying the scene. When I go back to scene one, you weren't looking, Charles, but that's okay. I see it. We're Zero back where we started. Now, this is the part where people go, whoa, whoa, ho, 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 hold on a minute. What? what? I thought I had to set that to nil or do something. Well, it looks very much to me like when a scene is destroyed, Corona goes back and says, wow, look at all this other stuff that's created. I'll nil that out too. Because the correct way to do this, as far as I'm concerned, is you create it, you fill it, and later on in the destroy, you would set that to nil. And what you're telling Lua is, take it away, it's all yours, destroy it. But clearly, Lua or Corona has said, hey, Lua, you know, I'm not using this thing anymore. Take it away. Let me just run this again. Scene 1, scene 2, 29.78. Scene 1, back to 0 0.31. Let's do scene 3. Same tables, 29.78. Back to scene 1, 0 0.31. So the only difference between these two examples was that in the destroy, I didn't set that variable to nil, but I did in three. Now, I still suggest that in your, your, in your destroy, that if you have variables which are outside the scope of your, your scene methods, so they, they're, they're basically locals within the file scope, that upon destruction, if you are done with that table, I would suggest you set the variable to nil. It's just good practice. Okay? And, there, and the reason for that being that you know that you've explicitly removed it? You have explicitly followed the Lua rules and say, hey, Lua, I am done using this. You may garbage collect this now. Yeah, otherwise you have to you have to remember when okay does Corona do this for me or does it not do this for me? But right. at least if you just do it the, yourself all the time, you know. This is a not. special instance. I think this is one of those weird cases where the Lua or the Corona guys, sorry, have something and I can't see how they did it, where they said, "Hey, we see that you created a table when this module was loaded because the scenes are basically modules, and we're destroying it. We're gonna just we're gonna clean that module up." Oh, and by the way, since we're destroying it, we're going to nil out that table. I mean, that's what I'm guessing. Because otherwise, that memory should all still be there. But it goes away. I don't know. Best practice is to do what I do in scene three. Nil it out yourself. That way you'll never get in trouble. Okay, I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Um, now, I code my games in two ways. Typically, I do just what I'm doing here. If I have a table or some kind of structure that I need to be visible in the create and the will enter and the will exit or elsewhere, I create a variable at the top of my file where I declare it. And then at some later point, I'll put a table in it or I'll do something with it and then I can start using it all over the place and know that it's going to be visible from line 20, in this case, down. Now, uh, there is another way which I have suggested people do this, which is what I call scene group management. So in this example, let's go to scene four. And this table this code is going to look extremely similar. What I've done here is in the creation, I have created a local variable called big table. And then I took the scene group, which is provided to me by the scene manager, and I added a field to it called big table. And I assign big table to that. So now, anywhere in my code below, where I get the scene group from Composer, it's going to have, if I did this, it 
and let's let's assume that I'm I put some value in there. That value would now be visible in this, even though within the scope of this, big table is hasn't been defined. It's because it's now attached to our group. And the group stays alive until the scene is destroyed. So just again, what I'm doing here is I'm attaching some data for my game directly to a variable, a field, on the group. Now there's one disclaimer here. And I can hear Rob saying, hey, 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 hey. Maybe not just like that, but I, I know Rob, if he watched the show, he would tell me, hey, Ed, that's a good idea, except you got to be real careful about the names. So you couldn't do like, uh, you couldn't do that, right? I couldn't mm -hmm. assign, let's say, I couldn't assign big table my variable and then assign it to dot x. Why? Because the scene group, which is a display group, already has a field called x. You're going to be breaking the basic functionality of Corona if you do this. So uh, the takeaway here is, is if you're going to attach fields directly to display objects and scene groups and display groups, which are all display objects, make sure to use a field name that doesn't conflict with something that Corona is already doing. Now, one way that people do this a lot of times is they simply put an underbar or two underbars there, and you're almost guaranteed that you're not going to get a name conflict because very rarely does Corona use double underbar names for their fields. Could you also start every variable off with uh, like RG? Like yeah, like I, that's what I used, gamer. To, you know, I used yeah. to put RG and then uh, some variable name or a little yeah. underbar to make it more legible. Something like that. You know, whatever your personal style is, that, that'll work. Just find a style that works and follow it religiously and you'll be good to go. Yeah. Okay, so oops. undo all these changes here. So this is uh, scene group management. So what I have done is I've taken the responsibility of remembering to clear this variable out of the equation. So what's going to happen is, regardless of whether I'm doing the Lua version or I'm doing the display objects version, I've created uh, a table. I have attached it to my group. And later on, when this group gets destroyed, Every field that is attached to it gets nilled out automatically because the object is being taken away. So now, if I have, you know, in my old style of coding, I might have dozens and dozens of different tables and variables up here. And then I got to remember every time I add a new one, I got to go back down to destroy and say, oh, remember to nil that out. Oh, don't forget to nil that out. And you can forget. I do it all the time. So, if you want, Simply make it part of the creation step. You create it, you add it to your scene group, and forever after that you'll be able to access it anywhere within the file. Anywhere within the file that has access to the scene group, I should say that. And you don't have to remember to nil it out. It's done for you automatically. It's like one less step. Nice. So uh, let's see here. Let's go ahead and run these just because I can't remember. Okay, so in the first one here, You'll notice that the destroy doesn't do any special clearing, but just because I'm being super careful, you don't need to do it. it scene 5, exactly the same code, except in the destroy, I did set the value to nil. Now, this is completely pointless. You don't need to do it in this case, because in either case, if I do it, let's go to scene Scene but, 1, 0 but, 0.31. But for illustration purposes, it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, whoops, I clicked the wrong one, didn't I? Scene 4 takes us up to 16.14 megabytes. Go back to scene 1, goes back down to 2.31. Again, retaining that memory for Corona's use. Let's go to scene 5. 16.14, scene 1, 2.31. Everything's handled perfectly in both cases. So this was great for illustration purposes, but totally not needed. Um, let's see. So as far as memory usage goes, that is about all there is to it. Uh, I think uh, I should summarize is that if you create references 
above your scene definitions within the file. Upon destruction, remember to clear them. That's all you got to do. Just set them to nil, and that way you're telling Lua, go ahead, you can recycle that memory. The other thing you got to remember is if you create a display object, I'll say this one more time, I said it last week, and you want it to be managed by Composer, give it to Composer, i.e., put it in the scene group that Composer gives you so that it can manage your objects. You forget to do this one step, one line of code, and Composer will be completely useless to you as far as managing your objects. You will be getting crazy behavior. It'll be frustrating. You'll get crashes. All the questions I see in the forums where people go, hey, I did this. I used Composer. It didn't work. It's usually where the question stops. But, you know, what if I say, it crashed. Or the next time I came back, everything was black. Or, you know, whatever. The point is, is you're not managing your stuff. You're not putting it in the scene group. Don't forget to do it. All right. So enough harping on that. So that was uh, two, three, four, five. Let's talk about shared data. Another question that was asked. Um, now, now share, is shared data part of persistent data between scenes? No. Okay. Uh, let me just elaborate now. What's the difference between persistent data and shared data? Um, persistent data, I think there are people using this term. They ask the question, and they may be using it incorrectly. Persistent data is data that is stored between sessions. When you say that you are persisting data, what you're saying really is that data gets stored to the disk, to the memory on the device, so that later, if I quit the app and restart it, I can get that back. I can restore it. That is really what persistent data is. Am I being clear? Yeah. No, that's good. Well, if you're gonna, if we're gonna get into that part of the discussion, let's save it for next week. Oh, uh, we already have time. We are out of time. Yeah, we're out of time. Know, for well, it's just a, it's just a good topic, and there's a lot of stuff to cover. So let's let's take and do persistent data next week, and if we have time, do, next not, week, do not make that a sound effect. But what what that I just did? I can't believe that we did not. Oh, oh, I am now definitely for sure. Oh, I can't believe it. Okay, well, yeah. uh, for folks listening, I'll clean this up when we release it. So the one through ten will list the actual examples. Okay. Nine and ten don't list the correct examples right now. Okay, and then and then if we have time next week, we'll do we'll do uh, custom transitions as well, and then you know eventually we'll move into transition library, which is a whole se separate set of transitions, but similar but but different. So, but I think that's good. I think that's a good place to be for, for this week. It. I can't believe it. I thought I had this all slotted out just right to get it done. Nah, that's all right. I mean, it just as we talked about uh, the, the we talked about a lot of things at the beginning of the show. So sometimes that that just eats up with it. So uh, it's hard to know sometimes whether you're, you know, when you're yeah, lining out these topics, cool whether it's going to be it. yeah, whether it's going to be going to go long or going to go short, and then and then really really want it to have be a, a conversation where you know spontane spontaneity can happen. So sometimes we want to just leave it open where we can talk about something and and then get those little nuggets that we hadn't planned. So Whatever. It's all so, good. Uh, for people who are listening, just let me know in the feedback yeah. if I'm being a little too uh, lectury or taking too long on topics. I mean, you know, I don't want to do that either. I don't, I don't want it to be boring or you're like, hey, you already told us that three times. You don't need to tell us again. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Give us give us feedback. Leave, let us know how we're doing and ways that we can improve. Uh, you know, the show is – we like to think of it uh, – Or I used to go to this uh, stylist who he says, I'm not a machine. You know, he cuts your hair. You want you want to go to get the haircut the same way you like the way they did it last time, but that person is a person. <laughs> They're not a machine. You don't stick your head in the machine and get a haircut. You know. So. I'm always telling people that too. I'm not a machine. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And and sometimes those little nuggets of information, like I'm always over here scribbling notes while you're talking, and there's sometimes those little pieces that, you know, come to mind when you're sharing pieces of information that you may not have thought to put in the notes. But they come to light during a conversation, so those those are the things that we're after as well. Yeah. So so there you go. We'll talk about next week. We'll talk about persistent data or shared data between scenes, yep. uh, custom transitions, and all that good stuff. So be back here next Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific for more conversations about building apps with uh, Corona SDK. Oh, and hey, if, uh, I'm sorry, Charles. I keep interrupting. No go. You, but people listening, if they want us to take a break for Composer and like do something else between, they might, you know, maybe they don't want three shows of Composer. So I'm happy to finish the discussion.
But at the same time, people are jonesing for some other topic. We should do what we should do is totally do the the uh, summer cliffhanger. We'll be like, and when we come back in three weeks, we'll talk about the rest of Composer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, we should. People will be like, holy what? No. <laughs> Unless the season's canceled. <laughs> All right, guys. Keep on that last part, folks. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, have a great week and happy coding. Peter Zane.